Welcome to Protect, suicide prevention training podcast for healthcare professionals. I'm Manan, consultant psychiatrist, founder, and head of faculty at Progress Guide. Good day. This is Mahi, your host. We are on to episode 23. In the last few episodes, we have dived deep into the challenges in supporting people with a borderline personality disorder, particularly amidst a suicidal crisis. We spent time in episode 21 understanding splitting as a psychological phenomenon. In episode 22, we went through all the diagnostic criterion and then finally shared Jill's story. Here is a recap of Jill, a 30-year-old female who has presented to Edie in suicidal crisis requesting admission. The background is that she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder a few months back. She is case managed by the Mute community team and awaiting DBT. She's had multiple crisis admissions in the past that have been generally unhelpful with increasing self-harm and aggression on the ward that requires constant observation and seclusion to manage safety. On assessment, you establish that there is worsening suicidal ideation in the context of recent relationship conflict She's feeling hopeless and wants to end it all. She's seeking safety and containment through admission. You were faced with a decision and we wanted you to think about the where factors and how each one of them might impact your clinical decision. Manan, will you please provide a summary of how the where factors play out amidst a borderline crisis? Sure. Of course, we have covered these in detail in the last episode, but uh, no harm in repeating these things again. So the five aware factors are anxiety, waiting, agenda, resources, and experience. In a suicidal crisis, there is intense anxiety, particularly so when the person has borderline personality disorder. This is because how overwhelmed the person is feeling. They end up projecting their entire distress on the assessor, which is quite anxiety provoking for the assessor too. The automatic consequence of that is to prioritize containment of the situation over establishing the facts behind the presentation. So it may be very tempting not to delve too deep into Jill's story, particularly if an assessor has managed to elicit a blanket safety reassurance, which are incredibly shallow and we advise against using them. So remember that there are two purposes to an assessment, a stated one, which is of course to assess, and the other non-stated one, which is to contain the crisis and capture hope. Do not skip to the second without properly completing the first, however tempting it may be. Premature crisis resolution without thorough exploration of the presentation is a recipe for an error in judgment. The more we dig, the more we find, the more anxious you may feel. This might stop you from exploring and conducting a full assessment with Jill. Be aware of your level of anxiety and stick to the task of establishing the facts with kindness and compassion and only then work towards the second goal, not before that. The second factor was waiting. You know, waiting captures how suicidality in someone like Jill with borderline personality disorder gets diluted by their diagnosis. Chronicity of repeat presentations and the nature of the crisis, which is often social in origin, following relationship conflicts, financial issues, accommodation problems, and sometimes alcohol and drugs are in the mix as well. Remember that the standardized mortality rate of suicide in severe borderline personality disorder is the highest, it's 45.1. The diagnosis increases risk of a life lost through suicide. It doesn't decrease it. The third factor, agenda, reminds us of how patients with BPD can sense rejection and abandonment from a long way away. If as an assessor, you perceive that they have an agenda to get admitted and your job is to keep them out of hospital, then beware, they will perceive this feeling you have even before it enters your consciousness. This will be followed by their need to feel safe, their drive to prove that they are in crisis, and that they need an admission immediately and the risk will escalate. So be very aware of your internal state and make sure that you engage in candid conversation about what you are perceiving and get them on board with the discharge plan. 
we will discuss this in more detail today and in the following episodes as we work our way through the number of nuanced conversations that need to be had with people in borderline personality disorder. The penultimate theme, resources, plays out in all presentations, but particularly with patients with BPD because of the heavy usage of staffing and bed resources. You know, we mentioned this in Jill's story as well with seclusion and restraints and continuous observations, delays in discharge. So often patients end up in these constant observations, which is very resource heavy and admissions will stretch out as threats of self-harm escalate at the mention of discharge. And, and that's due to the intense anxiety patients with BPD feel. Thus, assessors are often quite reluctant to support short crisis admissions even when they are indicated. And finally, experience. The experience of the same patient and how it had panned out before or different patients with a similar presentation has a huge impact on decisions that are made. Remember that although it is important to stick to the plan that has been formulated about this particular patient, it is also important to treat each presentation on its own merit because a lot might change in between presentations. We will build on the discussion from the previous episode today as we progress Jill's story. So this is where we are with Jill at the moment. Following the assessment, the clinician calls the on-call consultant. Given Jill's past history of hospital admissions, which were generally unhelpful where her self-harming escalated, a decision is made to avoid admission. The consultant strongly recommends to the assessor that Jill should engage with the community team and avoid admission if possible. The assessing clinician is concerned about Jill getting highly dysregulated when she is told about the decision. So today's podcast is primarily about how can this conversation be safely navigated and how Jill can be brought on board for the journey ahead. What are the different shapes this conversation could take? What topics could come up in discussion and how will you navigate them? This is worksheet 6.4 in the Protect Workbook and it's on pages 20 and 21. Remember that Jill has presented in crisis to the emergency department and we are about to send her home. She might have come looking for hope or had hope in her heart of receiving help and she's going to perceive this as rejection and abandonment which is invariably going to increase the risk. In this situation, is there any way in which the power of relational safety can be used to bolster safety? That is the fundamental challenge. And we discussed this in detail in episode 19. You know, well, we talked about the concept of empathy in action. It's um, in the guidebook. It is, I think, page 40, chapter 5, I believe. You know, how relational safety stems from the three components. Cognitive empathy, the idea that your thoughts in my mind. Emotional empathy, your pain in my heart. And empathic concern, which is essentially my genuine desire to help. The communication that is about to happen with Jill is a fairly nuanced conversation that has to be done with sensitivity, paying attention to all three components. So, in effect, you are emphasizing the need to look at the world from Jill's point of view before you communicate the outcome of the assessment? Absolutely. If you look at it from Jill's point of view, she came looking for support with hope in her heart, as I said, and at the surface of it, we were about to send her home and nothing has changed for her other than the fact that she feels even more helpless and whatever hope she had has now evaporated and faded away. So are you saying the decision to send her home is the wrong decision? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. It may very well be the right decision to make. But from Jill's perspective or the perspective of Jill's family and her loved ones, it will appear that she was seeking out help, looking for support, and all those gestures has done more harm than good because she's going away feeling more hopeless than when she originally arrived at the ED. This is confusing. So it may be the right decision, but the person feels more hopeless? Well, once we go through the different conversations, it will become more clear as to why this may be the right decision. But you are correct when you say that Unless we are able to have a deeply empathic connection or re-establish that connection again and foster relational safety, it may feel to Jill and her family 
that as the assessor, you just don't care whether she lives or dies. And this goes back to the discussion on abandonment and rejection, which is heightened for people with BPD and even more so when they are distressed. That's correct. Does this apply only to the ED setting or others as well? Well, you just need to change a few specifics in in Jill's story. And these reflections or conversations could end up being conversations that are needed to be had, uh, say, at the point of admission onto a ward or during an inpatient stay or a discharge from inpatient or even when a crisis is bubbling in the community or as part of psychoeducation with future planning in mind when someone is actually doing quite well in the community. So you, you just have to change a few things. Like, for example, how do we make sure that the discharge process from the ward is without a hiccup? So for that, you might need a similar conversation right at the very beginning of the admission that, you know, in three days time, you are going to get discharged um, because it's a crisis admission. And a similar conversation may be needed to the one which we are going to have in ED when we are going to send them home without actually admitting them. And these conversations are all about restoring relational safety. So if it is about to be ruptured when an assessor conveys the decision? Yes. Rebuilding relational safety in the moment or proactively having conversations with someone with BPD so that when a crisis does happen and say they do not get admitted, they already have an understanding that these are the reasons why they were not admitted. So Worksheet 6.4 has these five conversations. They are advice versus action, containment versus empowerment, short-term versus long-term, inpatient versus community, and complicated versus complex. We will try and cover as many of these in episode 23, but some may spill over into the next episode. Each of these conversations relate to a specific aware factor. For example, advice versus action relates to anxiety. Containment versus empowerment relates to waiting. Short-term versus long-term relates to agenda. Inpatient versus community relates to resources. And complicated versus complexity relates to experience. Is there a unifying theme for these conversations? Uh, As I mentioned, the golden thread is one of relational safety. And and that comes with trust. In order to re-establish trust, one has to put their cards on the table. As Brene Brown would say that the path of courage goes through vulnerability. It takes courage to put one's cards on the table, open up one's thinking to the person in distress and show them in no uncertain terms the rationale behind the decision. That does make the assessor vulnerable. Practitioners worry about how they may be misquoted or quoted out of context if they are too open or too honest and candid with the person they are supporting around why they are doing what they are doing and in this case why they are not admitting Jill into hospital. However, if you are not open and Jill feels that there is more to the story than you are providing, rest assured you won't be able to establish trust and relational safety will stay ruptured or will rupture even further. I remember you saying in the pain relief conversation from chapter 3, page 20 in the guidebook, how important it is to see the world from the person's view before you try to show them the world from the practitioner's view. The emphasis on empathy and action sounds similar to that. Exactly. Before you share what's on your mind, be very clear about the kind of thoughts the person will have when you share the outcome that, you know, sorry, I believe your needs are better met in the community. Think. If you were walking in their shoes, you know, Jill's shoes, what would you think as Jill? What would you feel? And given we can never really step into someone else's shoes for real, as we just haven't got the same life experiences, you need to multiply the intensity of the pain three to five folds in order to kind of get anywhere close to what Jill might be feeling. And then think, you know, would you believe this professional in front of you and that they have a genuine desire to help you? That is the challenge of relational safety. You are about to break bad news. Something that the person in distress believes is in your locus of control, something that you can influence, and you're about to deny them access. But you still want them to believe that you genuinely care 
for their safety and well-being. So, saddle in. That is the flavor of the conversation that you need to have. So, shall we get started? Sure. The first one, which relates to the anxiety theme of the WEAR framework, has got the title Advice versus Action. Will you start with a summary of this conversation? Uh, It may be easier to think of this as a personal reflection rather than a conversation. This could be a conversation as well if a practitioner is feeling really confident and has good rapport with the patient and doesn't mind being vulnerable in front of the person in distress and put their cards on the table. So to cut a long story short, patients with BPD are often told that the anxiety they are experiencing can be mastered. We call it distress tolerance, affect regulation in training, different names, but the same concept in terms of advice that we give. You can master whatever you are experiencing. The reflective question we want you to ask is the actions you take or we take in terms of decisions we make regarding admitting or not, are they congruent with the advice we have given to the person particularly every time we give in to the anxiety. Do you mean practitioners give the advice, face the anxiety to patients? The same advice applies to the practitioners too. Will you elaborate? Uh, Yeah, of course. So that is spot on. If our therapeutic intervention is built on the premise, face your fears, then we need to role model the advice that we are giving in the decisions we make and the actions we take. Someone in the midst of a borderline crisis is scared and overwhelmed by thoughts that they are going to do some serious harm to themselves. And we talk about this in the next conversation, containment versus empowerment. We tell them that recovery entails learning to persist with the plan in the community and that, Jill, you should face your fears, or at least that is what we should be doing and communicating when we are telling Jill that that is the right thing to do. Having to communicate, hang in there, although you are perilously close to let go of the cliff's edge, is very anxiety provoking for the psychiatrist, psychotherapist, or the assessing nurse, or allied health clinician. But that is what we need to communicate. And in that situation, if we do not role model by facing our own anxieties and actually give in to the anxiety by not following the plan that has been formulated and ending up admitting them without thorough consideration of what might this mean in terms of the message we are sending to Jill, then we haven't role modeled our advice in our actions and through our actions have actually given the opposite message, a very different message to what we have been asking the person to do in terms of facing your fears. But you also say that there will be times when a practitioner should listen to the anxiety in their gut and act accordingly. Yes, that's true. And that is what clinical decision making entails. It is the art of knowing when one should listen to the anxiety and perhaps admit Jill. And when one should listen to the anxiety and perhaps persist with the community plan with increased support. You did mention this was more of a reflective question. The advice that I give Is it role modeled in the decisions I make and the actions I take? Are there any circumstances where you might actually share this with someone like Jill? There are actually. But as I said before, if you're going to have this conversation about putting your own cards on the table, sharing with someone what are your thoughts in your mind, you know, you need to be ready to feel quite vulnerable. Can you say a little bit more about being vulnerable? Because it's not very clear in my mind what that means or how does it apply. Well, if you as a practitioner are going to share this reflection in some shape or form, you will actually be telling the person that you too are feeling anxious. Now, there is a societal expectation that as the healthcare provider, you should be the one who is providing hope. And somehow you are able to diffuse the anxiety, not fool it further. And sharing that you too are feeling anxious goes against the grain of that societal expectation. One may almost misinterpret it as you are not a good enough professional if you are anxious too. But the reality is that you are. You are worried and concerned about the person's safety and also in terms of 
If things were to go wrong, what does it mean for you? That is the honest truth of the matter. But having the courage to be able to share that with a person in distress puts the professional in a fairly vulnerable spot regarding how they might come across. How are they being perceived? Will they be misquoted or quoted out of context and so on? Bottom line is, it does take courage to be vulnerable. This is actually quite deep. Yes, deep and fairly nuanced. Conversations are two-way streets. We're not just dealing with the anxiety of the person with BPD. We're also dealing with the anxiety of the practitioner who is supporting the person with BPD. And your belief is that transparency creates trust and trust reinforces relational safety. Spot on. So how might you share with Jill that you too, as the assessor, are feeling anxious? Firstly, the decision to share will be dependent on your level of rapport with Jill. If rapport is quite shallow, you might not share this because you just haven't got the relationship to begin with. Secondly, the choice of words becomes crucial and practitioners need to be comfortable with what they choose. If sharing that they are feeling anxious makes them feel too vulnerable, one can replace the word anxious with words like worry or concern or discomfort about the decision that they are making. So you were talking about actually telling the patient that you were worried about the decision you've just made. Yes, what do you think I have said so far about being vulnerable? This is not an easy conversation. But in order to build or rebuild trust, you really have to go that extra mile. How do you do that though? How do you actually tell a patient that I have just made a decision that even I'm not confident in? Really, you don't do it in that way. One of the ways in which I tend to have delicate conversations is the in parts conversation. A part of me is feeling this, but the other part is feeling that. I And, you know, I want to think this through with you. So you were sharing your thoughts with the person? Yes. It's like a window into your own mind. You might say something like, Jill, there is a part of me which feels quite confident that the right thing to do in the situation is to engage with the community support. But then there is this other part which is concerned about your well-being in the interim and that part is really worried about your safety. And then that becomes a segue into a discussion about safety planning? Yes, it could be safety planning or you could just generally invite the person using motivational interviewing strategies to collaborate and how to make it safer or why it is important to engage with the community support. It really depends on the situation at hand and the level of rapport you have with Jill as to how you frame the in parts conversation. You can say, there is a part of me which feels confident that you will be able to understand why I'm not keen for you to be admitted and why community supports are better. And then there is this other part of me which is really worried that you're going to think that we do not care about your well-being and safety and then feel rejected by this current interaction, you will then end up rejecting the community supports that are on offer to you. And that really worries me. I can see what you were doing here. In this statement, you are trying to preempt all or none thinking, the kind of thinking that stems from splitting that we have previously discussed. So either I have an admission or I will have nothing at all and take nothing from you all and I might take my life because no one really cares. Yes, it does do that. But it is important to be genuine. Be intentional in the choice of your words, but not with any intent to manipulate the person. Just with a genuine intent to share what you are thinking through. Sometimes when you use a statement like that, you know, the one that I said, you know, this part of me feels this, the other part feels really worried. You will actually see that rapport would deepen. It's something you feel. It happens in the room. You feel it in your body. It's the creation of relational safety through empathy in action. It shows that you are genuinely trying to think through that the person may be feeling rejected by services. And you can go a step deeper by saying that if you felt that we don't care about you because we aren't admitting you, then I can understand why you might reject that. Could the opposite happen as well? Like the rapport coming shallow? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, That can happen and does happen because 
we get it wrong you know we get it wrong often or the person feels offended when you tell them that a part of you is worried that they may reject services because they might interpret that we are saying that they would reject services just to prove a point that is why in these situations the tone of voice a humble attitude and the correct body language is important you may want to soften the statement by adding a phrase like i may have got it all wrong but there is this part of me that is worried about this or end with saying i'm really hoping that this part of me is wrong and if you have put your cards on the table and the patient denies that you know that is the case say i'm so sorry for getting that wrong but i'm also feeling relieved to hear what you have just said i guess there is an easy way to manage the anxiety the practitioner is feeling which is to admit and the harder way to manage the anxiety which is not to admit and then travel with the patient through the anxiety easy and hard that's another nice in parts conversation to have where you can put your cards on the table so one can say jill there is this part of me which is so tempted to do the easiest thing to remedy this current crisis which is to admit and then you know what everyone sleeps better tonight including me knowing you are safe you will feel less anxious your family will feel less anxious and i will feel less anxious but then there is the other part which is telling me that that will be the easy way out and i am shying away from my responsibilities which is the much harder part to take and that is of supporting you through the crisis in the community because that is what is needed for you to learn that you can master the anxiety you are feeling regarding not being able to manage your safety or manage the anxiety that you're currently feeling and i really should be role modeling to you that i am prepared to share some of this anxiety that you are currently experiencing by choosing the harder path rather than the easy one and walking the next few steps of recovery with you however hard this may feel gosh these are really delicate conversations yes they are but when staff have a template to work from even if it feels artificial to work with they can develop the confidence gradually to connect in a meaningful fashion but if staff don't have the skills that actually makes it worse they make bland statements like i understand that this is disappointing for you <laughs> well you don't you're not in their shoes they came with hope and you have just taken it away they will actually tell you you don't understand or staff may seek safety reassurances can you keep yourself safe which are totally meaningless and responses to that vary from well i've told you i can't to someone saying they can because they have no more fight left in them to convince you that they are feeling unsafe worse still are confrontational statements which escalate risk like saying that it seems like nothing i'm saying is good enough what do you suggest we should do for starters yes it's not good enough because they were hoping to be admitted secondly it's not good enough because they have bpd and what is the central theme for them in terms of their personality difficulty it is splitting they split the good from the bad so seeing shades of gray and ash is not their strength it's all good or all bad and because you're rejecting them at the moment you are all bad and finally the bit around what do you think will help well if they knew that they would not be in the emergency department looking at you for the help they need so it is really important to build up the skills cuz certain words phrases and sentences may escalate the risk that's right uh, we will cover each of the conversations in the future podcast episodes so do stay tuned in but for the full exposure staff should attend our advanced aware program the one in which you run simulations with professional actors yes it's similar to the seven safe steps program which is very focused on safety planning but this actually looks at highly nuanced conversations with people with borderline personality disorder presenting in a crisis the professional actors make the course very expensive but actually it is money well spent you would much rather be having these conversations in a supportive setting where you can get constructive feedback rather than out in the field i guess you will still make mistakes as you learn through your mistakes but you at least have a foundation to actually have these really kind of deep conversations to create empathy in action and to create relational safety 
So essentially you practice the conversations based on case studies. Yes. You learn by observing first and then by practicing it yourself. And it is actually quite a fun, interactive way of learning. We have run out of time to date and it seems like we have barely scratched the surface of these conversations. Well, we have four more to go through. We have only covered advice versus action. So how could our actions be aligned to the advice that we are providing people with borderline personality disorder. But because we have talked this one through in a fair bit of detail and we have introduced the in parts technique, the others might go a little bit faster because people would know one of the key techniques that they can use in order to have these really sensitive, nuanced conversation because you're trying to create relational safety through empathy in action. Sometimes you need to go slow to go fast. And the nuances of this first conversational topic, advice versus action, does make it sound like one of those where you need to give it some time to digest. Rarely does just saying something makes it better. What makes it better is connection. And through the words that you are offering, you are hoping to reconnect with the person where relational safety is ruptured by a decision that has been made. The decision is in the patient's best interest, but still feels in the patient's mind as rejection and abandonment. This is a challenging scenario, one that most practitioners will face. So pause and think about your clinical practice and what challenging conversations have you faced with borderline personality disorders? Have you had a scenario like Jill's where they do not want to go back home as they feel unsafe, but you were tasked with communicating the decision? You may be the consultant psychiatrist yourself, doing the heavy lifting, or actually a registrar, or an emergency department mental health nurse. What changes will you make to such interactions based on what you have heard today? If you have specific questions, please do email us at admin at progress.guide. Share your musings with us. Put your thoughts and tag hashtag guide progress. It helps get the word out about the podcast more professionals and supports progress to practice. You can access all the transcripts at www.progress.guide. You can connect with Manan on LinkedIn or follow our LinkedIn page by searching on LinkedIn for progress.guide. We are also on Twitter and YouTube. Our Twitter handle is at Guide Progress. As usual, please do follow the podcast. There'll be weekly episodes every Friday and share it with your colleagues. Your ratings will help get the word out. So please don't forget us to rate us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or Audible or whichever channel you are listening on. Challenges in supporting people with borderline personality disorder is a common knowledge and skills deficits. Given severe borderline personality disorder has a standardized mortality rate of 45.1, it is a critical area for suicide prevention. Helping healthcare professionals fine tune their practice in this area is an essential step in creating a workforce that delivers high quality care for people in suicidal distress. Remember, together we can make a difference. Tune in next Friday and we'll explore some of the other critical conversations with Jill. Thank you for joining us today and keep spreading the word.